Okay, we're back, but now I'm taking you to Daniel 7. Because once you see it, it's like, oh, why didn't I understand this before? Okay, you got four beasts, four great beasts. All right, first like a lion, wings of an eagle. That has to do, you know, maybe with the emblems of the country that they're using that. Okay, the, the, it, it depends on why you, why the word lion and eagle are used. Alright, because they, they symbolize. Nations have always had like mascots or animals that they compared themselves to. Like we have our standard is the eagle. But it's not talking about the U.S. here. This is way in the past. Alright, another beast resembling a bear. And then another one like a leopard. Okay, now, notice how... The first one, I kept looking until its wings were plucked. That means it loses power. It goes, it stops being an empire. It was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was given to it. In other words, it's the same beast that changes form. You got that. Here's another beast resembling a bear. It was raised up also. See, this one was lifted up. This one is raised up. And three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. Okay, after this I kept looking. And behold, another one, third one, like a leopard, had on its back four wings. The wings are a symbol of power also. Of a bird, the beast also had four heads. So it's a four four conglomeration empire and dominion was given to it after this I kept looking in the night visions and behold a fourth beast dreadful and terrifying extremely strong had large iron teeth to go with the iron feet it devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet and it was different from all the other beasts that were before it and it had ten horns in other words First you got the lion, alright, that's one kind of empire, and then it changes form, so it's still continuing, that's the point. Alongside it is another empire, depicted with the bear, alright, and it apparently ate up some other, you know, it's because it's an empire, so it's eaten up other countries. Okay, so it's particularly destructive. Then you got a third one, see? And it's a, it consists of four lesser empires or nations. And it was given dominion. The implication is that first there's a lion, but it comes, it changes form. It doesn't die. Then there's another beast that's kind of like alongside, and it goes on. Alright, but this one, the leopard one, if it's getting dominion, then it's taken over or somehow the beast, the bear, and the, the lion are morphing into the leopard. Okay, but now we get to the fourth one. And it devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder. It was different from the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. In other words, it's replacing the first three mentioned. Replacing. Now, as we later find out, specifically, the, 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 the beasts are actually named. You're talking about Babylon. You're talking about Persia. And for a long time, Babylon and Persia coexisted. And then you're talking about Greece, and Greece ended up eating. I mean, there was still a Babylon, and there was still a Persia, but Greece gained dominion over both. So they continued to exist, but they were tributaries of Greece. And then you got the fourth beast, and that's Rome, because Rome devoured and crushed and trampled down all the rest of them. I mean, technically speaking, it was like Byzantium and Persia fought each other until they both died at the same time, at about 630. I mean, Byzantium technically still continued to live 
and Persia still continued to live, but they didn't have any ability to really fight with each other, and then the Arabs come in and devour them all. Okay? But there still continued to be the stump of the Roman Empire in Byzantium, which is what Mark 13 covers. That's why I have to cover this now. Now watch. While I was com contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up from among the other horns, Tola 10, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. Well, what that means is one guy takes over from the three, as it were, kings, kingdoms, nations, and he conglomerates them. That's what empire really is. Alright? And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man. In other words, changing form like a man. Changing form. And a mouth uttering great boasts. In other words, you know, I'm really God. I'm really great. You know, I'm the Savior. I'm the this. I'm the that. All that's Matthew 24 language. Matthew 24 is talking back to this. Specifically, talks about Daniel. Okay? And that means to the end of time. And then Ancient of Days took his seat. This is Christ. Alright? White as snow. That's identified as Christ in Revelation. That's how come we know who it is. His hair is white, like wool. Okay? Throne was ablaze with flames. That means ability to judge. Wheels, that's in Ezekiel, burning fire. So, I mean, by the time Daniel's even getting this, you know, Ezekiel had already been, had already had his wheels vision. Okay? River of fire, judgment, power, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. That's, you know, the, the entourage of heaven. And myriads, that's 10,000. Myriad means 10,000. So, 10 thousands, plural. Upon ten thousands plural, so it's ten thousands plural times ten thousands plural, meaning you can't number it. We're standing before him. The court sat, and the books were open. In other words, this is the second. This is the great white throne judgment. Then I kept looking because of the sound, or could be the second advent, because the sound of the boastful words that the horn was speaking. Oh yeah, okay. So it's not even yet the second advent. So this is this is where where John is keying off. He's talking about. You know, the scene in heaven, sort of split screen TV, the scene in heaven in Revelation 6 through 19, really 4 through 19. Um, Rapture's actually at Revelation 4 1. So, split screen TV, the court is sitting, watching the stuff on earth, listening to the boastful words that the horn, the little horn, who takes over three other nations, empires, confederacies, was speaking. Okay. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and that's of course at the end of the, the, the tribulation, destroyed and given to the burning fire. Destroyed does not really mean destroyed. It means ruined. In other words, not dead. Abad, yeah. It, does, it doesn't really mean destroyed. And how does, how does our boy translate that? Apolumi, yeah, that's what I thought. Matthew 25, 41 is gonna, is, talks to this. Apolumi does not mean to kill. It means to ruin. And so when, when Christ says later on, you know, don't worry about what anybody can do to your body. Worry about the one who can, can destroy can, can destroy your body, your soul in hell. It doesn't mean to kill. Your soul can't be destroyed, but it can be ruined. In other words, when he says, you know, temple, not one stone will be on another. Well, the temple stones still exist, but they're few, and they're ruined. When we have the Roman ruins or the Greek ruins. It's, it's not completely gone. Alright? It's like, you know, your house floods, God forbid. 
Okay, your house is ruined. It's still there. It still exists in a ruined state. Okay? So the body is given over to burning fire. You have hell. Okay? Poros means hell. Or fire, actually. Okay? So. Bring this back out a little bit. Now we go back to Revelation 17. You'll notice the text is larger. I decided to increase it because I don't know how hard this is to watch on a mobile phone. I'm just learning about mobile phones now. I got my first smartphone. And the text should be kind of clear because I looked at my other videos. So you should be able to see this fairly well on a mobile phone, but if not, you know, hopefully you're watching it in 1080p, which you can set in YouTube by clicking on the little gear. All right. So when it says the seven hill heads or seven mountains on which a woman sits and also seven kings, it's talking back to that Daniel 7 passage we just saw. All right. It's talking about empires. It's not talking about seven previous Roman kings, like the stupid, not so bright, allegedly, you know, degreed theologians have been saying for centuries. That's not, it's not Roman. It's empires like described in Daniel 7. We just saw that. Except that it's not, you know, th that was depicting four. This is talking about five have fallen. See, so it's not like the seven kings that were there were the seven kings of the last beast. This is a different seven. See, when you see the word save, it doesn't always mean save to heaven. There's many kinds of things that you can get saved from. You can get saved from harm. You can get saved in money. You know, you can get saved to heaven too. But you always have to say, well, you know, when you see the word seven, what seven? You see the word five, what five? Okay? And it's just incredible to me that, that theologians are so dumb. I mean, theology just isn't their field, I guess, even though they call themselves theologians. Alright? One is that last beast, the fourth beast. That's wrong. Okay? That's wrong. But the version of Rome, remember the change of form? changing into a man the version of Rome that will apply in the tribulation isn't necessarily going to call itself the Roman Empire anymore but it'll be an empire now this can't be too hard before I get into this stuff here down in verse 11 which is the focus of this video if the rapture occurred tonight then the world as we see it today will still be here. It will not be some, I mean, it depends. It will not be cataclysmic to the world that Christians disappear because you don't know how many Christians there are. The people who call themselves Seven Mountains can't even get the Gospel right. The people who call themselves Seven Mountains can't even get um, being in fellowship right they think you have to ask for forgiveness one of the big things that was upsetting Christians about whether to side with Trump or not was that Trump said he'd never asked for forgiveness well there's no verse in the Bible that tells you to ask for forgiveness and they say oh well that's the Lord's Prayer give us you know forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors honey that's not a request and you don't even use the Lord's Prayer, but before I even explain that, it says, forgive us our debts. It's a command in the Greek. I did videos on that already. It's not a request. You're not asking for forgiveness, you're demanding it. In that verse, in the Lord's Prayer, you're demanding it. But that's not the verse that applies. The verse that applies is Psalm 32.5, Psalm 
Psalm 66, 18, and 1 John 1, 9, the New Testament, and 2 Peter 1, 9. You don't ask for forgiveness. You name your sin to God like they all had to do in the Old Testament. See my Why We Need 1 John 1, 9 videos because I compiled all the verses in it. It's a video. Why We Need 1 John 1, 9. It's in Vimeo and it's in um, YouTube. You had to name your sin to God to get forgiveness. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you don't sin anymore. And when you do sin, you are out of fellowship. The Holy Spirit does not fill a defiled temple. When the temple was defiled in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit left. There was no glory of the Lord filling the temple. And you're the temple of Christ now because you're part of the body of Christ now. And when you sin, you're defiled and the Holy Spirit indwells you but does not fill you and therefore you are in a state of sin. And you have to name your sin to God. Now maybe, you, I don't know, this is true of me, you don't remember, oh God, I haven't, I haven't used 1 John 1 9 an hour. I must have sinned because I'm just, I'm feeling pissy or something. Dad, I must have sinned. I don't know what kind it is. Okay, fine. You're naming that the fact that you sinned. It's better if you can remember what kind it is. But honey, you don't spend more than two and a half minutes trying to do that. I don't even spend 30 seconds. Dad, I must have sinned somehow. I don't, I, I, I'm feeling angry or, you know, upset. You're not supposed to be upset if you're a Christian. If you make a typo while doing an email or typing a comment, you know, online, that then you're in a state of sin, name it, just say, Dad, I must have sinned. Use 1 John 1 9 like that. I must use it a thousand times a day. They don't, the seven mountains people around Trump and most Christians, if you talk to them, they don't know that that's what you're supposed to do. And if you don't, like 1 John 1 8 and 10 tells you, you're in the dark, honey. So how can maybe these people calling themselves Seven Mountains or most Christians who don't know about that first, they get the gospel wrong too. They think that you have to like repent of your sins and then you can be saved. No, Bible never says that. Mark 1.15 tells you what kind of repentance it is. Repent of disbelieving that Christ is the Savior. Okay, what think ye of Christ? Concerning sin that they don't believe in me. Not repenting of your sins. There's only one sin that makes you go to hell. You never believe in Christ. John 16, 9. Okay, well these seven mountains people don't know that. So are they even saved? The evidence of your salvation, there is none. Do you know if you're saved? I'm dead serious about this. Here's how you be saved. Believe that Jesus Christ paid for your sins. The minute you do that, you're saved. Because basically what you're saying is, Hi, I can't make myself be saved. You paid for me on the cross. You saved me. I believe it. The minute you do that, and you could have done it when you were five and not even know, then you're saved. So maybe these seven mountains people are saved. I hope so, but they don't know the gospel. They get it wrong. Talk to 100 Christians, 99% of them, 99 of them will give you a false gospel. The only true gospel is believe that he paid. John 16, 9. Concerning sin that they don't believe in me. See, there's no sin to confess before you believe in Christ. And after you believe in Christ, you're constantly doing it. Just like John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to purify, not cleanse, Purify, katarizo, that's where the word Catholic comes from. Purify us from all adikia. The Greek word means, they translate it unrighteousness, but it really means the, the malfeasance of a judge. It's like Donald Trump's making money for himself off the presidency. Clear violation of the emoluments clause of the Constitution you couldn't ask for. And the GOP is letting him do it. That's what adikia means. That you have an office of responsibility, like a judge, like a president, like a king, and you're using it for personal gain. Or you're using it to, for personal favors for yourself. 
So one John one nine. I mean, Dad, you know, I was doing a personal favor for myself. Of course, it really didn't do me any good. I got mad at Windows, or I got pissed off in traffic, or I killed somebody. I mean, really, a sin is a sin is a sin. Some sins, you know, are worse than others, but it's still the same problem. A sin is a sin is a sin. So you name it, and then you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and then you can finally discern. And the Seven Mountains people are not filled with the Spirit. Now that gives you the background. So now we go. Seven Kings, Daniel 7. Five, not three, have fallen. We know about three. The one, the last fourth beast in Daniel 7 is Rome. We know about that. But Rome literal? No. Rome pattern. Why? Because as we saw in Daniel 7, the beasts change form. In other words, I hate to use the term, evolution. The way people use the word evolution is not what scientific definition of evolution even is. But it's like, hi, if you look at the sweep of history, you have an empire that lives and then it dies, and another empire rises on its ashes. Like, you know, Holy Ro Rome, Western Rome died, and Europe rose on the ashes of Western Rome. Okay? And then on the ashes of, of, of Europe, Europe's really still going on, of course. But basically, you know, the United States was born as a child of. And we're all following the Roman system of government. We're even still using the same calendar that Julius Caesar invented. Alright? So, it's like progeny. It's like descendant. So this is a sequence of of the same kind of thing happening in different forms over history. So one is Roman pattern. The other is not yet come. It's going to be related in a result of the Roman pattern. And how do I know that? Right here. The beast religion, which was orgy and is not, Rome was not orgiistic at the time that he's talking, is himself also eighth. You know, Pope, but not necessarily the Pope in the Vatican, a sort of popish function. And here's what we got to correct. When it says one of the seven, no, that word one is not in there. Let me show you. You know, it really helps if people would talk about scripture after actually reading it for a change. All right. Hello. We'll leave the KJV up there. KJV does get this one right. See? Is the eighth and is of. Oh, crud. Sorry. Of the seven. In other words, part of it. See? Ek ton hepta esti. What it's saying is it's an eighth like power, an eighth like head. But it's coming from the seven. Ek means out from. Preposition of birth. Born from the seven. Se hepta means seven. So eighth is even or and. Out from. Born from. The seven is. It's not one of the seven. It's from the seven. It's a product of the seven. And we know that also because, hello, we saw that already earlier. Woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Harlot. That's the, po you know, the, the whole polity, king's thing, the federation of whatever this is going to be. That's the one sitting on, riding on, the religion. In other words, to get political power, 
playing the religious card like the Christian right are doing. And there's nothing Christian or right about what they're doing. You got that. So, the beast, the religion that's carrying this stuff into politics, like stinking Ted Cruz, who plays the Christian card every chance he gets, which was an orgiastic Tower of Babel, and is not, because Rome wasn't really into that sort of thing at the time, is himself also an eighth head, an eighth power, like under Constantine. Except directly under Constantine, it didn't happen for another 200 years. You didn't have real popes until after Western Rome fell. Okay? And one of the seven, I'm going to have to take that call.